The 8th Bioceuticals Research Symposium is going digital and will take place over four weekends from the 6th to the 28th of June 2020. For more information and to register your place, go to bioceuticals.com.au and click on the Education tab. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us on the line today is Dr. William Walsh, He's president of the nonprofit Walsh Research Institute near Chicago and a key scientist driving the development of nutrient based psychiatry. His book, Nutrient Power, which describes an evidence based nutrient therapy system, is the result of his over 30 years of research and clinical experience. In addition to ongoing research studies, Dr. Walsh directs an international physician education program in the US and in Australia, teaching advanced biochemical nutrient therapies, which are now used by over 800 doctors throughout the world. Welcome to FX Medicine. Dr. Walsh, how are you? I'm just fine. Um, Really looking forward to coming to Melbourne next April to speak at the uh, Bioceuticals Research Symposium. I am champing at the bit to to meet you in person and to to learn more about what you have garnered over the years of research and experience, as we said. Let's go back a little bit in history, though. You studied the biochemistry of violent criminals for many years. Yeah, that's that's how I started, exactly. I was actually a prison volunteer you know, and I was not involved originally in research, but I was working at Argonne National Laboratory, and uh, my, 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 my program um, uh, basically just grew and grew, and eventually I had 125 people volunteering and helping at Statefield Penitentiary. And, uh, but as we went on, I started an ex-offender program trying to help prisoners when they got out, helping them to uh, not, not repeat what they had done. And I met the families that had produced the criminal, and that's how, how I really got started. I, I learned that many of these people, many of the criminals, came from really good families with other brothers and sisters who turned out fine. And we realized we didn't understand what was the cause of violent behavior. And since I was at a research organization, we, uh, I started doing chemical testing, trying to see if I could find differences. And that's really how it all began. Okay, so just going back a little bit further than that, what tweaked in your mind that it might be biochemistry-based, um, that, you know, this cause of violent behavior? Well, the reason was that uh, before that, myself and most, most people in America and probably Australia too, uh, had, the, had the belief that, that criminals basically uh, were, were that way mainly because of, of trauma, especially early in life, or of poor parenting and, and life experiences, basically. Mm. And what I learned in talking to the families was they were telling me that these children were, some of them were uh, doing terrible things by the time they were two years old, and they were shocking and horrifying the parents. And, the par- and so I, I began to believe there had to be something else something innate, that they were born with a tendency for bad behaviors, or at least I was questioning that. So I started doing experiments to see if they were different, focusing on on, um, doing blood and urine testing to see whether I could find something related to brain chemistry. Um, What about nature versus nurture? What about just being born bad, your genes? Well, uh, what I learned is that the recipe for a criminal really is to have inborn uh, bad chemistry that predisposes to that, and then uh, to have a bad environment. Now, that would be the, the worst possible combination. Right, so the perfect storm. And what about the most common nutrient deficiencies or imbalances that you see in individuals with mental health, behavior, learning disorders, that sort of neurobehavioral disorder? Well, that was one of the biggest surprises to me because uh, anyone who studies biochemistry knows there are hundreds of important nutrient chemicals and and biochemicals. And what I found was uh, that the same same chemistry imbalances were turning up in, in behavior disorders, learning problems, depression, mental illness. 
And I kept wondering, why do we keep seeing the same ones? Well, it turns out that we learned eventually there were six, there basically are six nutrient imbalances that dominate mental health. And uh, this is a really fortunate thing because it would be really hard to try to do lab testing for hundreds of factors and, and even more difficult trying to normalize dozens and dozens of factors. Uh, and this is really the good news. It turns out uh, that there really are only six primary nutrient imbalances. And, and the reason is they're the ones that are directly involved in the synthesis of neurotransmitters or in the functioning of neurotransmitters. Mm. And that's why they keep turning up. And uh, so there are six of them. And we focus on, on testing and normalizing those six imbalances. If, if a person happens to have an imbalance, we normalize them. And it's, it's been very successful so far. You know, I've always remembered something that my psych nursing lecturer said to me, and that is, it is only a matter of years, perhaps 20, now this is back in the 80s, um, where all mental illness is deemed to be of a biochemical nature. The questions, though, still persist about how do you measure what's going on in the brain by measuring what's going on in the serum or the urine? So how do we get to that sort of stage? What's the, what's the correlation there? Well, that certainly is the challenge because we're not going to be able to do, uh, do samples directly in, in the brain or brain fluid. Certainly um, not willingly. <laughs> the, unless you want to do cerebral spinal fluid yes. testing, which uh, I've never found no. anybody yet that wanted to do that, <laughs> including the doctors. Um, no, what, what we've learned is that um, we've, we've, I've now seen more than 30,000 patients for whom I've done pretty extensive lab wow. testing. And I, I have maybe the world's lar I think I have the world's largest chemistry database for depression, for schizophrenia, for behavior disorders and ADHD and even autism. And, and by, by looking at the studies and, and, and mining this data and studying it, we find that, that there are distinctly chemical imbalances related to specific mental disorders. And that that gives it, and, that's, and there also are symptoms and traits associated with specific mental disorders and, and and specific chemical imbalances. For example, people who are under methylated are uh, in general they have about ten or fifteen really uh, typical tendencies that are different from other people. So we can we can do a good job of of diagnosis by doing first a uh, a really quality, careful medical history, which gives us a lot of clues to their chemistry. And then, of course, to do some of the lab work that, that can, that can um, the two together can, can make us very confident about diagnoses. And I think we're maybe 95% accurate in this process. Yeah. So when we're talking about these nutrients, like the, the ones that always stick up in my mind are the very simple ones, zinc, B6, magnesium, over and over and over again. But, you know, when you speak about methylation, um, then we'd be talking more the the um, B12s, the folates and things like that, perhaps the zinc as well. How do you clinically tease apart what's happening in methylation depression? And do you work on the methylation cycle per se, or do you look upstream with what's happening biochemically? Well, I've, I've learned that, uh, that, that the methylation cycle is important. However, doing that alone and looking at the SNPs is not nearly enough to learn how to help a patient. Mm. You have to you have to fold in the epigenetic effects, and the combination of of, of of mastering methylation, and also taking into effect the epigenetic effect, which is not the SNPs. The SNPs have to do with the quality of the of proteins that are genetically expressed. Yeah, the epigenetics has to do with the rate, the kinetics. Of, of gene expression, and they're right. equally important. And, and you cannot just study one by itself, or else you'll often get the wrong answer. And I, I think that's really been a, a major advance in being able to help patients is to, is, is to uh, do, the, do them both together. One classic example is a, a, a large number of undermethylated people have low serotonin depression. And we know that if you want to improve methylation, you might want to give them methylfolate or folic acid or, or folinic acid, and that would help their methylation. The problem is these patients would get dramatically worse, worse because of epigenetics. Because of epigenetics, folates lower 
serotonin neurotransmission. And so you have to, you really need to, uh, to be aware of both and, 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 and make sure that you are accounting for both, for both together. Really works out beautifully. Um, what about substrates here? Like, for instance, you know, tyrosine, um, tryptophan. How effective are those? Years ago, they were used to tryptophan in very high doses um, until, of course, there was an issue with manufacturing. But how effective are they in making substrates for, say, serotonin or dopamine? Well, that, that's absolutely an important question. And, and just to go back historically, uh, starting in about 1965, that was the time when the biochemical revolution hit psychiatry. And, and people started focusing on neurotransmission and receptors and, and the biochemistry of the brain. Um, and, and for about 30 years, up until 1985, the focus both in, in, in uh, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies and in researchers and people like us was um, trying to change the amount of the neurotransmitter, mm. like the trying to use uh, the, 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 the precursors for, say, serotonin. Yes and tryptophan and that sort of thing. And however, uh, 1985 was a, was a key time because that's when science learned that the amount of serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine, the amount of the neurotransmitter is not nearly as important as reuptake. Reuptake is sort of a 90% effect, whereas just the amount of serotonin and tryptophan and other sort of, that's only about 5 or 10%. And, and so uh, we're now focusing on on uh, nutrients that can affect reuptake, and and basically we we can we can adjust neurotransmission through epigenetic therapies. So it's it's far more effective uh, than than uh, working with the, with the precursors. The orthodox physician would say we'll just go the SSRIs or the SNRIs and be done with it, but we still can lack the substrate going in there. I mean, a reuptake inhibitor only works on that which is there to reuptake. So how do you balance that? Well, the, we, with nutrients, we can do exactly what, what what's, uh, Prozac and Paxil can do. I mean, what, what, is, what, what do Prozac, Paxil, and Serizona and all these uh, antidepressants do? They get, get into the body and into the brain rather quickly, and they, they interact with, the, uh, with reuptake. That is the, the, the uh, process by which um, neurotransmitters like serotonin ejected into a synapse uh, quickly return to that original neuron. And what they do is they disable these passageways, these reuptake passageways. These, they're called transporter proteins. They're really, they're really um, uh, ion channels. And uh, what we can do with nutrients, we can, we can affect the population of those, of those passageways. So what we, the way we can do this with epigenetics and methylation, we can use uh, something like SAMI or methionine, yeah. and, and we can we can reduce the genetic expression of those reuptake proteins on, on, on the neurons. And so while, while the drugs can sort of inhibit the function of them, we could, we could adjust the number of them. And so we, we could actually accomplish the same thing. We, we now have nutrient therapies that are very effective at, at, uh, at changing neurotransmission rates uh, we could do it just as well as the pharmaceuticals, although the pharmaceuticals could do it more quickly. They can maybe do something in two or three days that might take us uh, six or eight weeks to accomplish. Right. But we can get the same thing done without side effects. It's more inexpensive, and it normalizes the brain. We don't have to put a foreign molecules into the brain like, like, like psychiatric medications. We can use nutrients, and we can actually normalize the brain and correct many of these problems without any side effects. And what about general healthy diet? You know, and and here I'm going to obviously concentrate on vegetables. You know, we've got Professor Felice Jacker in Melbourne doing really good work showing that a good diet affects mood. You've got Julia Rucklidge at Massey University in New Zealand using just a very it's not a, a, an extremely high dose multivitamin mineral, and yet she's sh- showing mood improvements as well in certain cohorts, certain um, like ADD, that sort of thing. Um, so how important is just general diet? Because 
We know that people from low, lower socioeconomic uh, groups are more likely to commit crime. And we know, also know that people from lower socioeconomic areas are more likely to have a poor diet. So where does the diet fit in and, and the nutrients on top, you know, and like, how do you balance that, that nutrient specific versus broad nutrient intake? Well, um, a bad diet, an improper diet, uh, can actually aggravate a problem, and it's more of an aggravation than the cause itself. The uh, and and the question really is, what is the proper diet for a person? And what we've learned is that uh, that that really all human beings have biochemical individuality, and the best diet for one person might be the worst diet for someone else. For example, a person who is overmethylated, we could identify that with testing. Um, they thrive on green vegetables and, and folate-rich nutrients. However, undermethylated people, uh, they for them, that usually makes them worse, uh -huh. and they thrive on a protein-based diet. So it's highly individual, and it's important to know what a person's individual biochemistry is, even with diet, not just with nutrient therapy or or other methods of treatment, but you, you need to know their a person's individual diet. Every person, if we were to do it yourself or myself or anybody listening to this, were to do a complete metabolic analysis, they would probably find that they had four or five or six key nutrients that they were deficient in because of genetics, and they would throw, they would do really well if they had many times the RDA uh, of that because they're fighting genetics. But the, 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 the truth is that nutrient overloads usually cause more mischief than deficiencies. Right. And that's why uh, I, 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 I never recommend multiple vitamins indiscriminately to someone because included in those multiple vitamins and minerals are things that are really harmful to the, to the individual. Gotcha. So it's all individual. Could this suggest that your data can actually group different types of patients with um, various mental illnesses? Well, absolutely correct. It took a while uh, for our, our, our database to get larger and larger, but uh, a couple of years ago, I went to the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, which uh, there were, I think, 20,000 psychiatrists from all over the world, and I basically told them they were doing, I thought they were doing depression all wrong. Uh, the mainstream psychiatry believes that most forms of depression involve low serotonin activity, and the treatment of choice usually is to start with, with uh, antidepressant medications. Uh, what, what, my, uh, what I explained to the group was that, uh, my, that, that uh, my, my database indicates there are at least five completely different disorders that are biochemical disorders mm. that, are, that, that, are, that are called depression. It's, a, it's like an umbrella term for completely different disorders involving different neurotransmission neurotransmission abnormalities of different neurotransmitters and requiring different treatments. And yet we're giving the same thing pretty much to everyone. And so I, I, told, I, I showed them what the different types, the biotypes of depression and, and the neurotransmission uh, abnormalities that needed to be corrected and how each one needed completely different treatments. Um, I, and I, I believe that's exactly what's going to be happening in future years. Uh, depression right. is not a single a single um, uh, disorder. It's a, it's a name given of completely different disorders. Why, though, isn't nutrient therapy more widely accepted with treating mental illness? Uh, I have to say that in our in our physician training programs that are now in several countries, um, our most enthusiastic doctors are psychiatrists. Right. They absolutely love to be able to take a patient, and instead of just spending half an hour, an hour with them stroking their beard, wondering uh, what medication shall I give this person, they can now do inexpensive lab tests. They can identify which neurotransmitters are misbehaving and in what direction, and it can guide them, um, even if, you know, even with identifying the best or the most promising medication, but also it can, it can show them how they can help these people uh, by by uh, correcting their chemistry in more natural manners, but uh, I I wondered the same thing. I wondered why after all these years. I mean, I, I've given I presented at the United States Senate at the Surgeon General's office and mm. at neuroscience meetings and the 
the, the all, you know all the major meetings. Everybody would say, "Gee, that's interesting," but you know nobody would believe it. And and I finally realized they didn't believe that nutrients would have the power to help people. God. They would they would <laughs> they would say, "Don't you really need a powerful drug to get the, to get the job done yeah. if you got a person's got a serious problem like suicidal depression or schizophrenia?" And the answer is not necessarily. And that's why when I when I finally decided to write a book, uh, I I called the book Nutrient Power. I think that's what is really needed with mainstream medicine to, for them to realize that nutrients can have great power, especially now that we understand methylation and epigenetics far more better than we did before. Yeah, I think that, but it's it's really changing. Uh, I went through th- more than thirty years of of frustration trying to c- convince the world. That, that this can be really helpful and is the wave of the future. Uh, but uh, it's really getting better in, just in the last seven years. I'm sorry, in the last seven months, I've been invited to be a keynote speaker at at, at uh, six different conferences in Europe. Right. Um, so I think people are finally getting it, or at least they're starting to question it. Yeah. So I think we're, we're just recently starting to make real progress, and, and we're getting closer to being accepted by mainstream medicine. And, and I really think what we do has to become mainstream medicine right. eventually. You must have had some great cases you've been involved with over the years. Are there any specific ones that either got a dramatic improvement, which we'd love, but also any ones that you've had a dramatic um, deterioration in their mental health? Well, right. And any, anything that can really uh, help a person can harm them if you're doing it in the wrong direction. Uh, we, we, for example, methylation is always extremely important to get that diagnosis right. We need to know whether a person is overmethylated, undermethylated, or if they're one of the eighty uh, percent who have normal methylation. Because if, if for example, if you if you gave folate, methylfolate, to an undermethylated depressed person or an undermethylated bipolar or schizophrenic, they will get worse, even though the folates would improve their methylation. Uh, Another another example is postnatal depression. That's one of the five types of depression that we that our database has identified. Mm-hmm. And, and these people basically have postnatal depression because of extraordinarily high copper levels. The copper levels that escalated more than 100 percent during the nine months of the pregnancy, and they don't have the genetic capability to 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 normalize copper. Their copper level is supposed to come right down after the baby's born. And they don't have that capability. Well, ex- really high copper levels, that that's, means you're going to have extraordinary high norepinephrine and adrenaline levels. And that's a recipe for high anxiety, for depression, and in some in se- severe cases, psychosis. And uh, we've now done hundreds of postnatal depression patients, and uh, they're probably the easiest people of all to help. They, they uh, It takes about six months to carefully... Uh, normalize their levels of copper, and and zinc is the uh, the primary nutrient that yeah. helps you do that because zinc stimulates the metallothionine proteins that are genetically expressed, and they're the ones that have the job of regulating copper. Um, but that that's a group that uh, we're more than ninety percent successful with, and the typical patient who uh, bipolar, I mean, I'm sorry, the a patient. With, with postnatal depression, who may have suffered for 20 or 30 years with this condition, um, most of them become quite okay after two to three months, and they can throw their medications away. Right. Um, can I just ask a quick question here about genes? What genes influence copper metabolism? Copper is primarily uh, managed by by the genes that by the metallothionine family of genes. Right. There are four members of four genes that are metallothionine genes. And, and they have a number of roles in, in biochemistry, but one of them is to regulate copper. And they do that uh, if, if, for example, a person's copper level uh, elevates in, in, in their blood, uh, that will be sensed. And what, what happens then is that uh, it, it greatly, there's a great increase in the genetic expression of metallothionine, which then essentially grabs onto some of this copper and prevents it from getting into the bloodstream. And that's how copper is regulated. Uh, copper is so important to a human being, especially for mental health, that that uh, that we need to have copper normalized within a pretty narrow range. 
And uh, most of us have a system that works really beautifully. Um, and, and you could actually be chewing on copper bars all day long and your copper level would be okay if your if your natural biochemistry is working. Yeah. But some people don't have the ability. Some people have SNP mutations in, in their in, in, in their metallophane uh, genes. And and they're the they're the ones who, who are prone to postnatal depression or other other conditions involving high copper and even that that's one of the types biotypes for schizophrenia by the way is really elevated copper right uh, yeah I see I see in Australia um, it's not quite a paranoia but it's certainly an aversion to copper and yet it's an essential nutrient, an essential mineral. Um, however, some areas of Australia, particularly Western Australia, have intrinsically high copper levels, not necessarily due to the piping that was used, just high copper in the water. But it seems also to be, you know, sort of moving its way over to the eastern coast. I'm not so sure about this. My question to you is, do you see geographical influences of behavior, if you like, from nutrient availability in soils. Um, do, you, do you find that this plays an important part or is it more just that person's genes and how they handle things? It's an important part. Uh, There's definitely an important part. And uh, Australia is a, is a, uh, is, is a uh, well-known for mining of metals. And I don't think that's a coincidence that, that people in Australia, well, when I've been there and tested more than a few thousand people, that they, they have a higher incidence of metal, metal metabolism disorders. Gotcha. Um, the, the Middle East, uh, I was contacted recently by uh, government people who wanted me to participate in a study of zinc levels in the Middle East, mm. Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, places like that. And it turns out they're, they're, uh, the, the zinc in, in their soil and in their waters is extremely low. And so the question is, is that one of the reasons why they tend to be a bit more violent than other populations? Um, yes, I think, I think that that is a, an important part of it. You have to have the right substrate, the right nutrients uh, going into the body in order to uh, have the proper levels. Yeah. And, and again, I want to I want to I want to mention elevated levels. Uh, are are also especially important, especially if you have a uh, high exposure to things like mercury or lead, the uh-huh. nasties. Um, but also, uh, if you have too much copper or too much iron, uh, that can cause all kinds of problems in a population. So yes, it's important. Yeah. Okay, Bill, I, I have to ask a question regarding zinc and and the forms of zinc, the ligand that zinc is is uh, joined to. For instance, we know that in Wilson's disease, it's zinc acetate that's the preferred or accepted treatment. How different is the ligand to carry the zinc to where you want it to go? It really doesn't matter that much. The reason why zinc acetate was used for Wilson's is that Dr. Brewer, who uh, basically discovered this therapy, which I think is a a wonderful uh, achievement by him, uh, he patented zinc acetate. Uh, for this, right? <laughs> uh, but but basically, all any form of zinc will work very nicely with Wilson's. Bill, you mentioned your book earlier, Nutrient Power. What was the spark that that drove you to write that book? The drive to write the book was the frustration that after years and years of having what I thought was wonderful data and good science, and presenting it at at, at, at meetings and and journal articles and that uh, was just simply was not able to really dent mainstream medicine. And I thought I, I needed to write a book to get this all in, you know, get part, at least part of it in print and to try to basically change the, the, uh, the system. Uh, we need to know the importance of, of nutrients and how they can be really effective uh, in, in treating some of these major conditions. You've also said that there's growing interest, especially amongst psychiatrists, with regards to your treatment programs. Um, we know that, say, um, behavioural modifications, CBT, DBT, um, that they're showing dramatic improvements in mental illness. But I, I wonder about prolonged influence in mental illness. Do you think nutrients will ever replace drugs fully? in the treatment of mentally ill patients? Yes, I'm convinced that's going to happen. I think as, as science advances, as time passes, I think uh, psychiatric medication, most of them will fade away from, from, from society. 
That's a pretty powerful statement. I'll tell you, we have so much to learn from you. And so without giving too much away and taking five hours to do it, um, you'll be speaking at the Biocidical Symposium in Melbourne in April 2020. What topics will you be covering in your talk that we can change our, our treatment for our patients? Well, I'm going to be describing uh, uh, recent breakthroughs, uh, especially in epigenetics, methylation, and neuroscience, and, and these breakthroughs have greatly improved our clinical capability. We can do so much more now than we could 10 years ago because we basically understand more, and a lot of it's the neuroscience because uh, our focus is on mental health and brain function. Um, uh, specifically, um, some of the things I'll be talking about, um, I'm going to talk, I, want, I think everybody needs to know about the, especially practitioners, need to know the six nutrient imbalances that have the greatest impact on brain function. And I'm going to discuss how to correct them without drugs and, and really change and improve uh, mental functioning. I, want, I think I should spend quite a bit of time on methylation and how to master methylation. And it's a lot more than just getting SNPs and, and looking at the genetics. Um, and, and then another topic, I, I, I really think that uh, in the last 10 years, the greatest advance we've had are these novel epigenetic therapies that can regulate gene expression. Uh, see, in the past, prior to epigenetics and understanding that, we we could we could give people tryptophan, and we can uh, you know we we can we can do we can work on the reactants that create neurotransmitters. Five HTP. But, the, but the, yeah. the really powerful thing is the the regulation of gene expression, the epigenetics, the reuptake. We can do that now. We can now change uh, the, the 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 expression rate of of enzymes. We can we can actually with nutrient therapy with science we can we can know what we're doing and we can actually upregulate or or downregulate specific enzymes and we never had that power before. Right. So I guess those are three of the major things I'd like to talk about. And I do want to do a, a bit of a call out, if you like, um, for those individuals, for those practitioners who you know, it may not be their area of expertise and they might be faced with a patient with a behavioural or a neurobehavioural issue. Where can individuals find a Walsh-educated physician so that they can pass them on to a more appropriate um, practitioner? Well, we now have uh, just passed 800 of them. And on our website, which is uh, www.walshinstitute.org, uh, we, we have a list of uh, many dozens of them. Uh, I think we must have at least uh, 30, 40, or 50 from Australia who, who uh, we, we give their, their contact information. We've got some really brilliant doctors from, from Australia and are some of the best uh, nutrient therapists in the world. I do have to also ask, you were talking about before, you know, throwing their medications away. Um, that may not be appropriate, certainly for a non-medical doctor in Australia. I'd like to talk about that. I think that uh, I, I think medications, psychiatric medications, have helped millions of people, and I don't think they should just throw them away. We need we need to we need to for science to advance to learn how we can achieve the same results that they can get with medications. I, I'm I'm certain that we'll learn how to do that without having to resort to foreign molecules like like drugs. Uh, but at this time. Uh, medications are extremely important, uh, and I, I think that we, we, we will gradually, as science advances, learn how to replace them with, with, with uh, better treatments. Yeah. I, I do remember, I do recall a, a study that used even just, I think it was zinc, to help SSRIs to work more effectively, and it was shown to be safe. So I, I guess there's this period I'm interested in about this period where nutrients can be used as an adjunct to help the patient in particularly through a difficult time. You're right. And, and actually, uh, with these 30,000 patients that we have worked with, I would say that probably 80, 90 percent of them were on a, on a psychiatric medication that was helping them to some degree, uh, in some cases totally and in other cases partially. Mm. Uh, once we would do our, our clinical work and we could identify chemical imbalances that could be corrected with nutrients, what we would do is we would demand, we would insist they stay on their medication at least for three or four months and do both treatments together, do the, do the drug medication together with our nutrient therapy. Right. Then after we have normalized their chemistry and we have a new reality, 
then we suggest that they go back to their psychiatrist and very slowly and carefully test lower and lower levels really to see what the what the uh what the optimum dose of the of the drug medication is now that there's a new reality some of the problem corrected in some cases all of it and and so the the drug medications are a key part of our nutrient therapy in that we like to you know we like to they're in harmony with each other nutrient therapy is in harmony with with uh, pharmaceutical medications and they work well together and uh what what happens with depression for example um, about 80 to 85 percent of the patients we work with uh, with depression uh, report to us, and their doctors report that they are greatly better. And so we, and we also find out that when they do the try to wean from the medication, or at least to see where they're at their best, that roughly 80 percent tell us that they're at their very best with zero medication. Uh-huh. However, 20 percent of our patients who are do- who have done the nutrient therapy tell us that if they go all the way to zero that they lose something right and we say so be it we are not against medications we just want people to be functioning at their best sage advice from a true expert dr bill walsh i could talk to you forever there's so much to learn (laughs) and i tell you i feel like i've just chipped the very tip of the iceberg I would urge everybody who's interested in helping their patients with mental health disorders, neurobehavioural disorders, to um, learn more from Bill Walsh, either if they're a medical doctor from uh, BioBalance in Australia and um, the Bill Walsh Institute over in America, and certainly by attending the 8th Biocidical Symposium in Melbourne in 2020. Dr Walsh, thank you so much for explaining uh, some of the neurochemistry to us today. This was this was very, very enlightening. Thank you so much for joining us on FX Medicine. Well, you're certainly welcome. Enjoy talking to you, and I look forward to the, uh, to the symposium. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. The age of personalised medicine has arrived with Bioceuticals Clinical Services DNA testing. Advances in genetic testing mean that we can address an individual's health needs according to their unique genetic profile. For more information, please go to bioceuticals.com.au and click on the Education tab.